computer? Cool. Okay, so we're back to the life of David and a man after God's own heart. In the last two weeks, we've talked about how there was two great examples of how David was a man after God's own heart. Two weeks ago, um, David asked to build the temple and God said, no, it's not yours to build. And David's response to God saying no was an example of how he's a man after God's own heart. He thanked God for all the things he did have and all the things God did want him to do rather than to complain or ignore God's word on what he was not supposed to do. So that was two weeks ago. Last week, we talked about Scott's favorite word in the Old Testament, has said, and how David was an example of has said by his react or his gifts to Jonathan's son and also to the king's son. Um, he offered his said to both of those. And this gift of mercy and grace, if you will, um, is another example of. God being, uh, David being a man after God's own heart. We said that there was two weeks of this, but this week is a third week of an example about how David is a man after God's own heart. And it's a little harder lesson. It's much harder to understand. Briefly, <clears throat> a couple of things from last week about has said, and, and you know, guys know how important that is to me. And I talk about it a lot. But I've talked about, if you didn't read what got sent out, I've talked about how has said flows from someone of, look at this, this is, everything is backwards. I hate this. <laughs> it flows from above to downward. Someone with greater power, someone with uh, sometimes greater wealth. But what I wrote, and if you didn't read it, I wish you would, but accepting has said requires humbling yourself. It requires acknowledging that relationship. And we see it with people often that, that someone will make a statement like, I don't want your pity. And so they reject this, this gift, this grace, but they do the same thing with God. And it's a, it's a shame. It really is. It's, it's a thing, but you need to keep it in mind that accepting has said, since it does flow from, from above up to down in that direction, someone with either more wealth, more power, more status, but it always flows that direction, that in order to accept it, you have to accept the relationship. Uh, and, and our pride gets in the way of uh, sometimes some great gifts. Uh, the other thing I really want to mention, last week we talked about how David saw so, so where we let, should, let me do real quickly where we left off. So we left off on 2 Samuel 11 last week, and we started with the Bathsheba story. So David was on the top of his roof of the palace. Bathsheba was bathing on top of, of her house. Go ahead. And <clears throat> David sees her and... I don't know. I've, I've read things that he may have broken six of the, the Ten Commandments in coveting and coveting your neighbor's wife and bearing false witness. I mean, you go down the list, but he sees this woman <clears throat> and desires her. And I mentioned <clears throat> that eventually he sends soldiers who go over and bring her to the palace. And the fact that these soldiers do this uh, almost, well, I guess without question, but they didn't have much choice. But my whole life, my entire life, I've heard this story and I've heard it told about this uh, brazen, wanton woman, Bathsheba. And it was almost like she's out there intentionally tempting David, even though she's married. And you know what? That's not in there. It's just not there. And bathing on the roof, the only place probably that could have seen her would have been David's much taller palace. But because in that, we live there, the lack of privacy, the heat inside, the fact that you don't want water, uh, wood is not, is not that available. They bathed on the roof. And it, it uh, was very, very common. And there's nothing to suggest 
that Bathsheba did anything wrong at all. He sends, he doesn't just send a messenger and say, hey, you want to come over for a little rendezvous? He sends soldiers who bring her back to the palace. And, and this, you know, maybe this is in the way of a little bit of confession, but I listened to that told to me my whole life. And there's always this assumption that she's like Jezebel. She's this, you know, this horrible woman. And it's just not there. It's just not. Uh, when the king says, come, and, and this, I think, may be one of the problems where, you know, God had told them, I really don't want you being ruled by a king. This is what happens when humans get this kind of power. It's almost inevitable. And I don't know. I mean, Bathsheba's long gone. I guess I don't owe her, owe her an apology. But, but we do this, you know, I mean, churches have done this thing where this, this woman tempted David. And I, it's just not there. So, you know, keep it in mind the next time you hear the story. She's, she's not to blame for this. I don't think in any way is she to blame for this. Yes. Are these on? Yeah. Go ahead. Bathsheba was not Jewish. Correct? Well, uh, actually, Bathsheba's uh, the wife of a Hittite, but they describe the daughter of, I, I think she is. Yeah. I think she is. So is that the line in parenthesis how she then purified herself? The, the purpose of that, that purification, yes, she was, she, I would, I think we should assume that she was Jewish and the statement about her purifying herself, why, there's no mistaken words in the Bible, I, I believe, and there's, and so they mean something. What it was saying there is after your cycle, then you um, purify yourself. And what that says is she was not pregnant before David had her come over. So there's no mistake. What, what that part of the story is saying, Uriah is not the dad. It's saying David is the dad. That's why that sentence is put in there. It's, it's, it's pretty unambiguous when it says that about her time of purification. What that means is she absolutely was not pregnant, was not pregnant that that was, that was David's child and not Uriah the Hittite. And it's there to make it clear to everyone who reads the story that that's what happened. Yeah. So the, the other part we left off at is, so um, Bathsheba you know, tells David she's pregnant. David wants to do the cover-up. The first thing he does is bring Uriah back. He uh, tries two things. First of all, he says, hey, her, Uriah back, you're back from the war, go stay with your wife. He says, well, I can't do that. Then the next day he gets him drunk, hoping that he'll go home that time. So we ended up with verse 13 of chapter, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 13, when it said, then David invited Uriah to eat and drink with him. He got Uriah drunk and he, in the evening, Uriah went out to lie down on his cot with his master's servant, but did not go home. So now he's tried to cover it up twice. Do, do you want yeah, me to read? The, the next part, Mary's going to read it, but yes. I, I, I think it just keeps you awake. I'm seeing David Rejecting has said for the oath of God. He's doing things that are not responsive to accepting the unconditional love. He's going to do his thing. He says it here again. This is not the first time, as we all know, several times. It's going to cost him down the line. Sure. But but then the phrase about being a man after God's own heart. Sounds empty to me. Well, uh, stick with us. We're yeah. gonna we're gonna cover that. And it's this actually, Gene, it's an important question because what and what Mary said at the beginning, this is gonna be harder to understand, but in its way, what we say this week, what we cover this week is gonna establish David as a man after God's own heart in some ways more than the others. But it's a hard lesson. Let's, let's take a look. Okay. To me, to me the thing that you David about God's own heart, David sincerely repented. A lot of people regret, but do they repent? That's where we're going to go with yeah. this. That's a big part of it. So okay. let me join that a little bit, because we're going to go to the psalm, psalms again. They're sounding empty words to me. Well, There's a guy that wants to 
say the right words with no heart. Well, let's talk about it. We're gonna we're gonna cut exactly what this is about. Uh, but but the thing on this, what Mary's about to read, is one of the most terrible episodes in the Bible. But the one thing I want you to keep in mind. Abner, who had been the warlord, the, the leader, the military leader for Saul, was killed by Joab. And you remember Joab tells him that David wants to talk to him and, and sneaks up on him at the gate and stabs him to death. Now go ahead and read. Remember who Joab is. The next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Put Uriah at the front of the fier fiercest battle, then withdraw for him, withdraw from him, so that he may be struck down and killed. So Joab besieged the city. He assigned Uriah to a place where he saw the strongest enemy soldiers. And when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of David's servants fell, and Uriah the Hittite also died. Joab sent to David a full account of the battle and instructed the messenger, <clears throat> when you have finished giving the king all the details of the battle, if the king's anger flares, he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Did you not realize that they would shoot from the atop the walls? Who was the one to strike a Abimelech, son of Jerobesalel. <laughs> was it not a woman who dropped an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If so, then you are to say, your servant your Uriah the Hittite is dead as well. So the messenger set out and reported to David all that Joab had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, the man, the men overpowered us and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archers shot at our servants from the wall and some of the king's servants were killed and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead as well. Then David told the messenger, say this to Joab, do not let this matter upset you for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and demolish it. Encourage him with these words. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And when the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. So, first of all, I reminded you about Joab, what he had done, the way he killed Abner. And if you remember at the time, David condemned him for it. David said, these, these sons of, and now I can't say the name, but they're just too rough for me. They're too, uh, they're too wild. I can't contain them. But he knows who Joab is. And so he's tried all of these ways of getting Uriah to go to his house to spend the night with his wife and Uriah isn't having it. And so then he writes a letter to Joab. He knows who Joab is. He knows that Joab won't have a problem killing a man or, or setting him up to be killed. And Joab doesn't disappoint. He knows who Joab is. He has a willing accomplice all he has to do is write a letter. And he gives this letter, this death sentence to Uriah to actually carry to Joab. The man is carrying, it's sealed, no doubt, but he's carrying his own death sentence. It's a horrible thing. And what he tells Joab to do is to send, send Uriah up to the front lines, to the most dangerous part of the fighting, and then back away from him. Just leave him stranded there so that he'll be killed. Joab knows a better way to do it. He's cunning. And what he does is he sends a bunch of men up too close to the city wall. Remember, they're besieging the city. This winds up taking over two years, closer to three. And so he sends these men up close to the wall, 
And it's easy to kill someone when they're sitting down below the wall. And so what Joab does, and this to me is horrifying, is he sends other men under his command to die alongside Uriah to give cover. If he had done it the way David said, where you send men up and then you all pull back and leave Uriah out there on his own, people are going to catch on. You just abandoned that man. You, you killed him. But doing it this way, he actually has other men under his command get killed to provide cover for what he's done. And then he sends a messenger to David, and this is one of those, uh, you know, plausible deniability kind of things. He says, um, David, uh, he tells the messenger, basically, David might be mad at me for sending these guys up so close to the wall. So when you get there, when you go to David, if he's angry and says, to, you know, says, why did Joab send these men up close to the wall? Doesn't he remember that Abimelech got, got a millstone thrown on his head by a woman for being too close to a wall? What, what was Joab thinking? He says, if he does that, if he does those things, so what he does with this is he provides David with a story. He, pro he lets David pretend to be upset with Joab so that none of this in Joab, none of this reflects back on David himself. He concocts this whole thing, and he says, if he says that, tell him that his servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. And then he goes on to explain, the men came out, and we pushed them back to the city gate, and darn the luck, some of the men were killed, and along with our men was Uriah the Hittite, your, you know, your, your foreign-born servant who lives here. And so Joab does this elaborate, much more elaborate than what David. So what you see, first of all, is David is not thinking. David knows he's in trouble because Bathsheba's pregnant. And he's not, and, and so he does, he comes up with a plan to kill Uriah in, in a way that is going to be obvious to everyone. Joab, being much more a cunning killer comes up with this plan, sacrifices other people. So he actually kills extras and then sends the story back in a way that even the messenger won't recognize what's going on between these two men. It's a horrible, horrible, horrible story. Um, and, and David sends a mess message back through this messenger. He says, go back to Joab and tell him, Joab, don't beat yourself up over this. These things happen in war. You know, don't, don't, don't beat yourself up. I understand. Just double your efforts and, and sack this city for me, and it's okay. The, the political theater between these two is disgusting. And then, of course, it says when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned when the time of mourning is over. David brings her to the house and says, you know, he's going to marry this poor widow and take this child as his own, which <clears throat> only he and Bathsheba. Now, you know, you wonder how many people have figured this out, but that's what happens with kings. They can get by with a lot of stuff. But anyway, he comes back, brings her to the house, makes her a wife, and they have this child. To go on to, to 2 Samuel 12 now, where things become, yeah. I, I, I don't think you can just leave the story there. Where is Hesed on all of this? Well, well Gene, has said is a is a is a gift of of grace. And in this case, this is not a story of Hesed. I don't know what to say. It doesn't really I mean Hesed well, uh, he did not accept it. Well said so who didn't accept it? David. David's action knowing premeditated. Oh, there's no, there's no doubt. This is a terrible thing. Has this is not, a, but it's not a story of Hesed, Gene. It's just not. Hesed does not always occur. What this is, and what we're going to see, is specific is words sin. from through th from God through Nathan that David despised God's word. This isn't a story of Hesed. Is just not always present. It's just not a part of this. Uh, there, there's, there's not a, there's not a. I don't know. I don't know how you can say that. He's, he's, he's the anointed one. He's been promised. 
Well, sure. David. There's there's has said that flows that flows down from God to David, and it, we will see, and that's what I keep saying. We will get there. It says that David despised God's word. He absolutely did. And so where it is is that David saw a woman and completely rejected the 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 gift for that. That's absolutely true, and that's what we're that's what we're going to get to. The the other things, you know, there there has been times in the past where David we could assume David was tempted to kill Saul and yet he went to God and God it says he strengthened himself in the Lord and this time there's no strengthening himself in the Lord he just did what he wanted to do but going to how how this works out then the Lord sent Nathan and remember Nathan is David's prophet. He was the one that David went to to find out whether he's supposed to build the temple. So Nathan is David's prophet. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. And when he arrived, he said, this is Nathan talking. There were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one small ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food and drank from his cup. It slept in his arms and was a daughter to him. When a traveler came in to the rich man who refrained from, ta he, who refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the traveler who had come to him, instead he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guest. David burned with anger against that, the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die because he has done this thing and has shown no pity. He must pay for the lamb four times over. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hands of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wife into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that was not enough, I would have given you even more. Why then have you despised the command of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You put her, Uriah the Hittite to the sword and took his wife as your own, for you have slain him with the sword of the Ammonites." Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. Before your eyes, I will take your wives and give them to another, and he will lie with them in broad daylight. You have acted in secret but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all of Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. The Lord has take, taken away your sin, Nathan replied. You will not die. Nevertheless, because of this deed, you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord. The son born to you will surely die. I'm going to stop there. Yeah, that's a good place to stop. <clears throat> so... David <clears throat> has seemingly gotten by with this thing. And, and that, I think, troubles people uh, a great deal, that, that this man has gotten by with it. I can tell you, A, we'll see in later chapters, but we don't get by with these things. And what we tend to do is concern ourselves, again, with the law instead of with our relationship with God. Uh, and we'll see in some of the Psalms that, that you know, David says he, he couldn't sleep. He's more than, he's, he, the sin is before him. But here's the thing, and Gene, you ask about has said, has said is always present in that God is always extending grace to us. This is a story, it's a word that we don't like to use, and it's sin. And if you want to look at sin as a rejection of has said, I guess it is in fact. It is, and it says through Nathan uh, that he's despised God's word. It is a, 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 a look at what God, you know, what God has set out for us and saying, I reject it. Um, 
So, so David, again, the, there is this, the, a lot of people look at this and have this idea that, that somehow because he's king, he gets by with this. Nathan comes in with this story and, and there are also people who get very upset because it's a, an animal that he bought and he's comparing a wife to an animal that you bought. It's an analogy, okay? If it has to be exactly the same, it's not an analogy. Uh, Nathan comes in with this specifically to tell David about, the, because remember, the king has to adjudicate matters often. So he describes this rich man that, that, that takes the one possession that this poor man has and slaughters it. Um, and, and that, you know, he just does this terrible thing in order that David will see his own sin, in order that David will see in this other act what he's done. David hears the story, is immediately angered. He says, that, that man, that rich man deserves to die for what he's done. This is a terrible thing he's done. And he has to repay the poor man. He has to repay this fourfold. And Nathan, of course, springs it on him and says, the rich man is you, David. You took Uriah's wife. The one thing he had, you not only took the one thing that he had, you've got so much that God has given you. And he says, look, God's given you all of this stuff. If that wasn't enough, God said, I would have given you more, David. I'd have given, but not, I'm not going to give you this other man's wife. You did that. And, and then the most amazing line to me, think of this. This is a king who's gotten away with this. And read again, 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. Then David said to Nat, Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And there's the thing. It, it, well, it rings empty with you. I'll tell you, I, I understand this. You, you're a criminal defense attorney. Are any of your people ever ashamed of what they've done? Yes. Some are legit, and then other ones say the words, and they're not really. We have a tendency, because David is a king, to see that powerful people never repent. So if you'll stick with us for the rest of this story and through the Psalms, David does something truly amazing. And if the words ring hollow... I don't know what to say. We do that because he's done such a terrible thing. And we like to sit in judgment. We like to look at something someone has done and say, this man did something terrible. And yes, he did. But what we have, there's a difference between David's relationship with other people and David's relationship with God. He pays, David pays an extreme price with, with humans for what he's done. But David's immediate reaction is, I have sinned against the Lord. And he sets about dealing with the relationship between him and God. And we have to learn that, that often what people do is, they, they, when they've done something really bad, is they don't even think about their relationship with God. It never enters into it, and they begin to think, how can I keep from being punished? And, and they, the, the relationship with God is completely uh, disregarded at that point. Our last, uh, at least put on the back burner. The thing I struggled with this week, and we talked a lot about, is when David says, I have sinned against the Lord. I'm thinking, what about Uriah? What about Bathsheba? What about... And remember, we go back to the definition of sin. Sin is being that separated separates from, separates us from God. God. It's not that he didn't do a bad, he, he did a horrible thing to Uriah. He did a horrible thing to Bathsheba. He did, but he, what he is concentrating on right now is his relationship with God. What God says through Nathan, the prophet, is because you've done this thing, because you killed Uriah with the sword of the Ammonites, you used their sword, but you killed him just as surely as if you had stabbed him yourself. You will never be free of the sword again. Remember, David has put together this peace, this, you know, I mean, he's subdued all the enemies. And he says, your kingdom, you'll never be free of the sword. You're going to have some, some, you know, this upheaval which we'll read about later. And he also says that this baby 
that that Bathsheba is going to have will die. Now, it's hard to say David got by, you know, with what he did. Did the law come in and punish him? Did David get hauled off to jail? Did David get executed the way the two people who killed Ishbosheth? No, that doesn't happen. But to say he got by with it uh, would be a stretch. And that's where we struggle with this story is that David keeps being king the same way Saul kept being king. But he doesn't, but what David does is immediately say, I've sinned against the Lord. And what we're going to see in these Psalms we're about to cover uh, is really a fairly remarkable thing. Should we go, should we, we should go on with the story in um, 2 Samuel, right? Now let's, let's, let's sum it up. Okay. So, da- David goes to the Lord. He pleads for the child. He, he, he confesses. He repents. He pleads for the child. But as, as Nathan has prophesied, as Nathan has said, the child dies. Uh, and David got up when he hears that the child is dead. David gets up from the ground, washes, anoints himself, changes his clothes, goes into the house of the Lord, and worships God after hearing the, this news. And this sits wrong with people all the time. And sat wrong with the people there, too. It did. He ate and went to his own house. Uh, and And people, what is this you've done, his servants asked. While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. And I'm sorry, you go ahead and read. I'm, I'm... Okay. While the child was alive, you were on um, verse 21. What is this that you've done, his servants asked. While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But when he died, you got up and ate. David answered, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me and let him live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. It's a thing that that sits hard with a lot of people. And, uh, you know, it sits hard with Mary when, when I do some of these things like that, because he does. He, he fasts. Uh, he, he weeps. He pleads with God. But there is a judgment implicit here. And we strain because you say then God carried out a judgment against David through this small child. We, we absolutely people, and I've read so many commentaries this week. Nonetheless, this is what it teaches. And then David gets up, cleans himself up. And people are just horrified. They're angry at him. You know, you're, you wept, but now you're not weeping for this child. And he says, you know, I, I did this to plead with God, thinking, who knows? But now that the child is dead, um, uh, there's nothing more that I can do that route. And, and it's, this sits hard with people. Let's read the end of this, just to finish up this chapter. Chapter again. He gives up. Child's dead. And so that his life about there's nothing else I can do. He doesn't have any faith any faith in the Lord anymore. No, well, no, he does. no, he doesn't. He's not, he's not, he's not giving up on the Lord. The answer to that was no. And for him to fast anymore, let let do we what, really Jean, have to read the Psalms? Here, here's the thing though, Gene, and we'd have to get to the Psalms to do that. But what I attempt to do, what I attempt to do on these things is to look at what's there. And it's possible to, to, to read some things in, but, but I try and look and we, you know, look at what's there. And right now, what David is saying is, I did, I pled with the Lord. The answer was no. And he, he, he gets up and resumes his life. I can also, you know, I, well, I'm not going to go into that here. Let's get to the psalm. Well, can I read the rest of this? Just to sure. Trip? Okay. When Jesus, then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and lay with her. So she gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. Now the Lord loved the child and sent word through Nathan, the prophet, to name him Jedidiah, because the Lord loved him. Meanwhile, Joab fought against Rabbah of the Ammonites and captured the royal fortress. Then Joab sent messengers to David to say, I have fought against Rabbah and have captured the water supply of the city. 
Now, therefore, assemble the rest of the troops, lay siege to the city, and capture it. Otherwise, I will capture the city, and it will be named after me. So David assembled all the troops and went to Rabah, and he fought against it and captured it. Then he took the crown from the head of their king, and it weighed a talent of gold and was set with precious stones, and it was placed on David's head. And David took a great amount of plunder from the city. David brought out the people who were there and put them to work with saws, iron picks, and axes, and he made them work at the brick kilns. He did the same to all the Ammonite cities. Then David and all the troops returned to Jerusalem. And remember, we re I read that section last week, that last part. This just shows the timing. This is like two years later, two or three years later, after that original battle that was talked about at the beginning of chapter um, 11. But the important thing, we're gonna go now to Psalm 51 and 32. We read these Psalms actually when we, at least 51, when we did the study on the Psalms. A couple of things to remember. First of all, Psalms are not in any order. 51 was written before 32 was written. You can pretty much um, determine that. But this, and this is the important thing to consider. This is a king who we could say got away with it, even though Bathsheba and his child died, but he's still king. And is he really sorry? This is a king who wrote this Psalm and decided that this Psalm was going to be sung Tallest people, go ahead. You have to remember that this part at the top, it says David wrote this title. David himself writes this for the choir master. He talks about the purpose of this psalm for the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came to him after his adultery with Bathsheba. There is a confession. There is a, and, and if, you, if you imagine this, these psalms are made to be sung before all the people. Rather than hide what he's done, rather than say to Nathan, oh, I've sinned before God, uh, and making that small confession, David writes a psalm about it that is sung in front of everyone, everyone. And it says, have mercy on me. And it says, this is after his adultery with Bathsheba. This is a, an ongoing confession for the ages. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving devotion, according to your said. He's begging for mercy, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Now, remember, he is not hiding this from the people. He is confessing. And he's worried about his relationship with God. Blot out my transgressions, wash me clean of my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. And I've dived on that word. It is absolutely sin. It is a harsh word. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. This, this is being... Um, this is being proclaimed in front of all the people of Israel. The king saying in front of everyone through this choir, through this choir, David is saying, my sin is always before me. Think Bill Clinton. He goes on TV and denies to everyone. This would be like Bill Clinton having gone on television and said, yes, I did it. It's this terrible thing. And, and I am, I, you know, I sinned against God. This is, a, this is a public confession that is almost unparalleled. And then he says a thing that also disturbs people. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And people say, what do you mean against you and you only? You sinned against Uriah. You sinned against, you know, Bathsheba. You sinned against all of these humans. And this gets dissected in the commentaries, in the Bible studies constantly. And I'll tell you, Mary and I went through dozens of them at least, and no one seems to notice that there's another sentence. 
I've done evil. What I've, what I've done is evil in your sight. I've sinned against, pardon me, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that, so that you may be proved right when you speak and blameless when you judge. What David is saying, he, he's not saying he didn't sin against Uriah. This is a conversation with God. And he's proclaiming to everyone his guilt. And he says, when I'm judged on earth, when I'm judged, everyone will see that it was right. He knows he's going to be punished. He knows there's going to be consequences. He's acknowledging that. And he's saying, I'm guilty. And I sinned against you. And for that reason, I know there's going to be consequences. And everyone will see that it was right of you to, to, to judge me for this. This to me is an amazing admission. Uh, surely I was brought forth in iniquity. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desired truth in the inmost being. How hard is that to be that honest? What you really desire is truth in the inmost being. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Were you wanting to say something? No, no. Create in me, and this is a famous line, create in me a clean heart of God and renew a right spirit within me. It's an admission that it, his spirit has been on the wrong side of God. Renew a right spirit, again, is an absolute admission that I've done wrong in front of everyone. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. You have to see through this that what David is concerned about is his relationship with God. There will be physical consequences. This is about his relationship with God. And then the next one, this is verse 13. And you have to, you have to put this in context. Actually, it's 12, 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. And Mary and I talked about this a lot this week. I have, over time, seen people do things, sometimes some, you know, pretty ugly things, and leave the church, leave the community, leave God because of something they've done. And you say, well, where's the logic in that? I, I've seen it played out so many times. It, it, it happens. And you go to them and they say, no, 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 I've done this thing. I can never go back to God again. And if you miss this, if you look at what David's doing here and you miss this, you miss a lot of the point. Because David is being public with his confession and his repentance, and he's saying, you know, wash me, cleanse me, and then I will be an example to other people about coming back to God. I have said, I said over the course of the psalm study that there's always a path home. There's always a path back to God. And if we ignore that, if we miss that in this story, then what happens to us? When we get in this shape, we wind up often in this situation where we say, God will never forget. And I don't know exactly why people do it. Uh, you know, I can speculate, but I'm not inside their heart. But they say, God will never forgive me. And they just walk away. And David is saying, cleanse me. Show, let me see your grace, your joy again. And then I will be restored to me the joy of your salvation sustain with me a willing spirit, then I will teach transgressors 
your ways. David is saying he's going to, to be an instrument of God and use this, this public repentance to teach other transgressors your ways, to teach them that there's always a way back to God. Don't underestimate this message. Deliver me from blood guilt, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing your righteousness. That's a thing that can only be known to David himself. My tongue will sing your righteousness. It doesn't say, let me off the hook. Let me feel your forgiveness, and my tongue will sing your righteousness. Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, and we've seen this several times, that you didn't want sacrifice. You wanted a contrite heart. David always understands this. You, he's saying, this is not about me bringing burnt offerings. Anyone can do that. He's offering a contrite heart. He says, you don't delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You take no pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise in your good pleasure. And so now here he's turned, and what he's really doing is saying, don't punish Israel for what I've done. Don't punish the nation for what the king has done. Your good pleasure caused Zion to prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. So, so you have about eight minutes. Eight minutes. Do you and want I to really get to want. The other one? Yeah, right. well, because I think it's really this All is right. a forgiveness. So I covered that one, but this is this is about contrite heart. This is about forgiveness. And this is about, I mean, David publicly acknowledging what he's done in front of everyone and saying, God, forgive us and don't punish the, the land. Don't punish the people for what the king has done. Go ahead. So this is um, Psalm 32. And in, in the Berean Bible, the head title of it is the joy of forgiveness. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose inequity the Lord does not count against him, in whose spirit there is no deceit. And listen to verse 3. When I kept silent, when he was trying to cover all this up, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was drained as in the summer heat. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not hide my inequity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you, while you may be found. Surely, when great waters rise, they will not come near. You are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. And then remember on these psalms, they're it can change voices. And the voice in verse eight is God speaking. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will give you counsel and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding. They must be controlled with a bit and a bridle to make them come to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but loving devotion surrounds him who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous ones. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Go ahead. I don't think we should we should close. You know, we should we're going to have to open with this next week because these the, these psalms tie together. But uh, how can I do this without? I don't think anybody was there. Nobody here was there. We taught a class one time, and we had a couple who had both been married when they met. They had both left their spouses and subsequently married each other. And one of them was very concerned, very upset by it. And there was this question of whether or not God would forgive them. 
we're told later in the New Testament that he removes our sin from us as far, as far as the East is from the West. This concept of forgiveness, humans tend to struggle with it. We get hung up on the idea that someone has done something wrong and like a bulldog, we just don't want to let go. And it's a very sad thing. It's a, it's a very destructive thing because we're told that forgiveness, God forgives. David has repented. David has acknowledged his sin. He's repented. Now, we're not to the point of talking about Christ. We're not to the point of talking about this atonement that Jesus brings. But David has repented. David has confessed. David has a contrite heart. And he has asked God for forgiveness. And he feels, through these words, we see he feels the lifting of that. And we have this terrible habit of looking at consequences on this earth. When someone does that, we, we tend to say, yeah, yeah, but he doesn't get what he has coming. I'm going to give you one of my, my personal uh, you know, boundaries in life. If we get what we have coming... We're all in trouble, all of us, each of us. And anytime I find myself looking at another person thinking, I hope that person gets what they have coming, it's like a bell. It's like it, something goes off inside my head. I ask for forgiveness. What David has coming is between him and God. And that's where David turns his thoughts and his words about forgiveness, about his heart. He's not concerning himself with what does or doesn't happen as far as earthly consequences. And, and again, this is a message that should not be ignored. There's always a path home. There's always a path back to God. There is always the availability of forgiveness. And people deny themselves that by an unwillingness to believe that God could or would ever forgive. This couple that I talked about, the, the one of the two, I, I had such a hard time trying to say, you know, yeah, that's not what God wanted for you. I, I'm telling you, that's not what we're supposed to do. But there is forgiveness. You may actually have consequences for doing it, but there is forgiveness. If you're worried about your relationship with God, that's a different matter. And that's what David is doing. And that's why I would say in, in some ways, if you want to look at why David is still considered a man after God's own heart, as king, David could have just said, this is not anyone else's business, what I've done. In fact, they try to do that in a lot of ways. They just, you know, they just kind of ignore it because he's king. Instead, he makes a confession that is, is, I don't know if it's unique, but it, is, it certainly stands out in history. And he concerns himself, and we'll see in future chapters the consequence of what David has done. And God has already told him, the sword will never disappear from your kingdom. From now on, you're going to have to, because you use the sword, you're going to contend with the sword from here on out. This is all about forgiveness. This is all about the relationship with God. And at that time, David concerns himself with that. He, he, he gets up off the, the floor of mourning, and he goes to God and worships. He worships God. This is an example. And he even says in the psalm, remember what we read, when you forgive me, when, when you turn your heart back towards me, then I will teach other transgressors your ways. He's concerned now about other people who find themselves in this condition I've been describing. And he says, I'll be the example. I'll stand up as the example of someone who absolutely despised the word of God and was forgiven. 
And look, he wrote 75 Psalms to prove it. He did. I, I think I, I cannot escape, Gina. What I see here is the exact opposite of someone just saying words. What I see is someone going to God and saying, I, I need your forgiveness. I've done wrong. All of this other stuff is, is what it is, but my relationship with you is paramount and I'm broken. He says, I'm broken. I've been broken, Gene, personally. Anyway, so I relate to this. And I think that we have uh, a particularly amazing example of David being a man after God's own heart, a man in his position, humbling himself in a way that most people are not willing to do. So, God, your mercy, your has said, extends forever. We, in the same situation, don't offer forgiveness. We don't offer mercy to others, to people who offend us. We seem at times to lack that capacity. And so it is amazing to us that you would do, you would do that instead for, for us, that you, the maker of everything, would extend that when we so much don't deserve it. It's not about deserving. Remind us of that, God. Remind us. Let us see the fact that we sin. Let us see the fact that sin exists. But then when we come to you, let us feel the forgiveness, the mercy that you offer. Turn our hearts back to you and serve as that example to other people who need the same lesson. You've given us these words of David for a reason. Give us the wisdom to see it. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you guys can unmute yourself. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. It was very Thank good. You. It really was. You. you doing good, Carol? What? I'm doing great. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm cooking and, and washing windows. Getting ready for <laughs> this one to come visit. That's going to be so cool. All those things. I want to meet you in person, Naya. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, we will. Oh, we'll, we'll do that for sure. Okay, that will be great. Thank you. You guys Thank have you. a good week. Were you able to get to? Was Jackie able to hear? No. Okay, you'll help we'll her get on. on it today. Okay, and well, when we the, when we have the recording, I'll make sure I send it to you, Sarah, so you can have her upload. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Mary. Thank you. Hi, Julie. Have a <laughs> Hey. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. See you later. Have a good week, guys. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.